Hello. Here to do another little uh, walk today, show you guys around another little neighborhood with a certain theme in mind. It's going to be very nice. Just casually sitting here enjoying myself. Don't mind me. Uh, today, I'm going to be telling you guys the stories of uh, some very influential women here in New York. And you may be wondering, oh, Tom, that's a really random topic to do. Well, that's not so random because uh, uh, National Women's Day is in like two months. Uh, whatever. It's a good topic anyway, so it's important to talk about. And, uh, you know, you get it mansplained by me, I guess, but it's a good one nonetheless. And uh, I think it's important. People don't talk about this stuff. Eric, how are you doing? First of all, before I ramble myself in outer space. Standing in this fountain. Yeah, you're standing in the fountain. Uh, you took your, your shoes and socks off, which is very nice of you. Anyways, before we start the, sh uh, the show, <laughs> uh, guys, check out the Patreon. Huge help. Uh, like, subscribe. The Patreon's how we fund these things, baby. That's how we keep this thing growing. Eric, what do you think, man? Should we just go ahead and get started? I have, I have a burning question. What's that? I cut a, I trimmed a little bit, huh? Oh thank you so much, thank you so much for noticing. <sighs> All right, well, that's enough patronizing. Eric, should we get started? Yeah, let's go. Let's go. So, a lot of people come to New York with big dreams of changing the world and doing something no one's ever done before but they just need the raw material to kind of push them in the specific direction they need to go. I'm actually here at the Brown Building uh, of NYU to talk about one of those people. Her name was Frances Perkins. She wanted to change the way people worked. When she was at college, she actually uh, took a tour of a mill located uh, nearby and with the intent of learning what it was like to be a worker and what kind of conditions they lived in. Pretty ambitious, it's uh, kind, of, kind of like what I did in, in college. Uh, so she comes to New York and that's what she wants to do and focus on. So she gets involved with the National Consumer League. But it was an event that happened at this building on March 25th, 1911, that pushed her even further along. That was the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. Here on the 8th and 9th floors, a fire started raging while the workers were up there. By the way, a shirtwaist is like a blouse. It's like a fancy word, uh, you know, but they were up there, uh, mostly women, mostly immigrants, and uh, they were locked in. Yikes. <laughs> you know, do you think the your job's bad? Uh, that was pretty bad. They locked the doors. They didn't want union agitators in there. They didn't want them taking unnecessary breaks. A total mess. Not exactly legal uh, now, but uh, the fire starts and you know, people start dying. They start burning to death, they start asphyxiating, they start jumping from the windows, they try to go out a fire escape, the fire escape collapses, a total mess. To make matters even worse, thousands of people gather outside here and are watching this all happen. One of those people was Francis Perkins. Francis Perkins is scarred by this. Uh, and 146 people died, 123 of which were women. Uh, and she watches this all happen and she makes an, an even harder push to change all the things that allowed for this to take place. But it's when FDR becomes the president of the United States. Uh, that's right, he was president for a bit. He appoints her the first female cabinet secretary in the history of the United States. Mm, look at that. And it's the secretary of labor. Look at that. She accomplished 40 hour work week, social security, workers comp, unemployment insurance, I mean, she did a lot, uh, even tried for health care for everybody. Uh, still crossing my fingers for that one. Uh, we'll see if that one, one, one day happens. But uh, she did a ton, including working for the WPA. She got, basically was the person who pushed the WPA. Uh, it was basically in charge of getting us through the, 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 the Great Depression. You ever heard of that, Eric? The Great Depression is what we, that's what most, of us, most New Yorkers are still in when they wake up in the morning. It's called a Monday. <laughs> you know, am I right? Okay, anyways, uh, so she was basically spearheading the Works, Works Progress Administration. She got tons and tons of jobs for New Yorkers at the time. Pools built, parks yep. built, buildings renovated, art created. I mean, it, it kept people like Ralph Ellison, uh, Jackson Pollock afloat by giving them public works. All of this kind of came into being because of, you know, Francis Perkins. And most of you guys don't even know who that is. You guys have heard of FDR, you guys know him from his little wheelchair and how, you know, how cool he is and stuff, but uh, you guys don't know who Francis Perkins is. I don't know why I thought of his wheelchair. Is that weird? I just no, thought... totally normal. <laughs> I just thought that's like one of his, like, you know, everyone thinks, everyone knows of polio and stuff. This is all very normal behavior. All right. So it was right here on March 25th, 1911 that, uh, you know, 
One of the worst disasters in textile manufacturing in history took place. Uh, second to only uh, the invention of men's capri pants. Okay, anyways, uh, yeah, Triangle Shirtwaist Fire right here, Brown Building. Kind of crazy. People walk right by it, don't know that, you know, like I said, 1911, some real crud went down right here. But that's my job. Tell you this. Mission accomplished. Next spot. <sighs> All right. New York has always provided a kind of escape for people who are leaving bad situations or also at the same time trying to, you know, strike out rich for themselves. Uh, strike out rich? That's not a phrase. Could be. It could be, but they're trying to make it, you know, while at the same time escaping something. Um, I'm actually here in front of One Shirt and Square, which is, uh, was the site of a place very famous uh, called Cafe Society. Uh, it was a, it was a uh, basically a like cabaret and performance space started, and a really popular nightclub started by the most obvious uh, type of partier back in the day, uh, a New Jersey shoe salesman named Barney Josephson, who actually started this in the late 1930s. But it was here that a very uh, famous jazz singer got her start, and that is Billie Holiday. You ever heard of Billie Holiday, Eric? Billy Holiday. Yeah, well, she started here. Pretty cool, huh? So her story is she came from Philadelphia, actually, uh, after her mother. So she had a really rough childhood, man. Like, it's, it's pretty tragic. She was sexually assaulted very young. Uh, she, she bounced around uh, schools and had, had difficulty uh, with all that. Her mom worked in a brothel and actually came here to New York, and she kind of came here with her. Uh, actually lived up in Harlem, was part of the Harlem Renaissance. She started working at the beginning with, with different bands. She was discovered by a producer when she was singing for tips at a bar that her mom worked at. And she worked with people like, you know, uh, Benny Goodman. Uh, but it was here that she kind of uh, went out on her own. And uh, it was here for, she was actually basically the house singer here, which is pretty incredible. And it was called Cafe Society because it was kind of poking fun at what was considered Cafe Society in up, up in Midtown. Uh, it was kind of like the fancy people, a little stiff, but it was here that they wanted to kind of break away from that. It was actually one of the first integrated nightclubs in, uh, in New York City. Uh, this is around the 1930s. And it was also here that she gained a lot of fame, uh, particularly because of the things she sang about. Uh, one of the things she sang about was civil rights in a way. There was a very famous song called Strange Fruit that debuted here. Uh, it was about lynchings, uh, you know, in the South. Pretty, pretty heavy stuff. It's not exactly the locomotion, but uh, you know, it was very important and it's something that people were afraid to listen to, afraid to hear, but she made it uh, more, I guess, uh, accepted and she made it a, a thing. And she I got her on FBI watch list. When you get pursued like that, uh, it means, you know, you're singing some pretty courageous stuff. Uh, you know, you're not gonna get uh, put on any watch list for singing, uh, you know, Call Me Maybe or something. So that's a good sign, right? It's a good sign when people take issue with your stuff sometimes. Sadly, when her mom died in the 1940s, she kind of got more into drugs. Uh, she also got into drugs with one of her husbands, uh, but all kind of trying to escape. The same way she came to New York, she was trying to escape her, her, her past traumas and history. Uh, and she got more and more into drugs and it, it kind of eventually led to her eventual uh, downfall. But the place, uh, the place Cafe Society eventually closed in uh, 1950 when uh, Barney Josephson was actually starting to get followed around by the FBI as well. Uh, kind of his both his locations, he opened another location and uh, closed up shop, unfortunately. Real but, FBI hangout. Yeah, a lot of, hey, hey, that's mine, dude. What are you doing? That's mine. Okay. Yeah, this is pretty much, uh, was pretty much an FBI hangout. Uh, you know, they, they really uh, like to pursue people for stuff back then. Like our totally chill FBI now. Yeah, our we have a very chill FBI and NSA now. Back then it was real, real tough. I guess people complain about being canceled today, but that was the, that was the real, that was the real getting canceled. It was the FBI putting you on a blacklist or assassinating you? Very different. This is Cafe Society. Billy Holiday is kind of launching pad. Very amazing talent. I would put some of their music, but we get copyright stricken, and then pursued by the FBI. So I'm uh, going to pass on that. What do you think, Eric? Should we keep, uh, keep moving? Full circle. Let's go. Let's go.
So oftentimes people come to New York with their uh, pastimes and their talents and their interests uh, and New York gifts them with the opportunity to put that to use even when that wasn't necessarily their initial intention. I'm here at 18 West 10th Street, very beautiful street by the way, I've covered it in lots of videos, uh, at the uh, old home of Emma Lazarus. Uh, she was the, the descendant of Sephardic Jews and she came here and she worked with a lot of the Jews who were uh, uh, refugees from Russia. But as a child, she had taken a huge interest in poetry. In fact, as a very young child, she was already translating complete works by certain authors. Uh, I mean, when I was a very young child, I was throwing Ninja Turtles off the roof, so that's pretty cool. So she comes here and she gets involved with uh, work with all these refugees and immigrants. These are people who left very terrible conditions, uh, the different pogroms going on in Russia and Eastern Europe. Um, it's interesting because in the early 1880s when she was doing this, the U.S. was also receiving a gift from France. France had gifted the United States the Statue of Liberty. How incredible. Only problem is they didn't give them a pedestal to put it on, uh, which you know, kind of need. Uh, and it's kind of an important part. You know, that's like, you know, getting a Christmas present of uh, a bicycle helmet and no bike. Uh, only difference is the U.S. didn't, you know, yell at France uh, and run away. Uh, anyways, you know what I mean. So they had to raise money to, you know, get this thing off the ground, literally. So one of the things they did is civic groups were organized and they started to try to find ways to get people to open their pocketbooks to donate money. One of the things they did was they approached Emma Lazarus, who had worked with immigrants but was also a poet, to write a poem to get people's spirits up about the statue. So she did. She wrote the poem, uh, The New Colossus, which goes like this. <clears throat> Give us your tired, your poor, your hungry, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. I wish I could snap more because my hands are freezing. That was pretty good, right, Eric? What's interesting about that poem is that it was written with an eye towards immigration in the city and immigration and, and, the, and the, the statue is a welcoming object for people coming here um, as opposed to what it was originally intended for. Uh, in fact, Frederick uh, Bartholdi, who actually designed the statue, his only intention was to build the biggest statue in the world. That's all he wanted. He just wanted kind of immortality for himself, which is fine, I guess. Uh, and then the guy who kind of helped him come up with the idea and everything, he just kind of wanted to plant Francis, this guy was Edouard Laboulier, he just wanted to kind of plant France's flag on the side of republicanism with the United States. They didn't have the idea of, of like immigrants and welcoming them. It was really Emma Lazarus who, who gave it that, who, it, who began that kind of vibe for the statue. Some people, you know, who uh, love to point out the fact that it wasn't intended for immigrants, uh, you know, and that really wasn't, you know, I guess the original intention. A lot of times the only lamp, those people are carrying is uh, tiki torches, if you get what I mean. It is true that it wasn't the original intention, but it developed also too because in the late 1800s there was lots of, uh, there was lots of immigration coming in, in the, into Ellis Island, into, uh, you know, into New York, and that was the first thing people saw on the boat. You can imagine that, Eric. You're on a ship and the first thing you see is the hand of the Statue of Liberty with that old torch sticking out of the fog, huh? Pretty cool, pretty cool. You're, up, you're on the pool deck drinking your daiquiri, I'm sure. Uh, you know, and then that's what comes out of the sky. Uh, that's, how, that's how immigration was, right? People were coming over on carnival cruises. Yeah. Uh, anyways, yeah, is where Emma Lazarus lived. And it's kind of cool because this kind of shows also, too, uh, her story and how she came over and really just took an opportunity that presented itself that only New York could give. And people are going to know her name forever as the plaque was put down on the actual statue forever uh, containing that poem. Uh, and the statue was dedicated a year before she died. Pretty crazy, uh, you know? And context, baby, that's what, that's what makes the city so great. You gotta know these stories about things like, you know, Emma Lazarus and the Statue of Liberty. Context, Eric. That's why I do this. <laughs> All right, what do you say we keep moving? So sometimes people come here with uh, their skills and talents, and it's the city itself that inspires them to do their life's work. I'm actually at 555 Hudson Street to talk to you about one such person, and that is uh, good old Jane Jacobs. 
Remember this name if you don't already know. It's one of the most, in my opinion, important New Yorkers to ever live. Uh, anyways, Jane Jacobs came here from Scranton, Pennsylvania, uh, which is like the New York City of northeastern Pennsylvania. But she came here to because she wanted to be a writer. She began to study the city and study cities generally and, and look into what makes a city tick and function and thrive. In fact, uh, she also wrote in 1961 her, you know, monumental masterpiece, if you will, called The Death and Life of Great American Cities. This book basically gives you the specifics of what it is that makes you enjoy a city, what it is that makes a city tick. It was around this time, too, that a man uh, named Robert Moses was a uh, very popular slash notorious slash racist figure in New York, but he was building lots of stuff. He was renovating, he was, you know, developing, he was demolishing, he was, uh, you know, displacing. So a lot of different things going on. A very contentious figure. She would take Robert Moses on in three very big fights here in this neighborhood and nearby. The first was trying to get uh, basically uh, a highway rammed through Washington Square. He was gonna put a highway basically through Washington Square. Uh, you know, and what would happen to Washington Square then? Where, where were all the, you know, parents of NYU kids gonna get offered drugs and then question their kids' decision to live in New York, huh? Then she had to do it again when he tried basically this urban renewal tactic here in the West Village. She was gonna demolish a lot of the neighborhood and uh, she fought him on that as well and won. And probably her biggest crowning achievement was in Soho, where she was actually recruited by the people who lived down there when he Robert Moses was trying to ram through the old Lower Manhattan Expressway, the Lomax, baby. Oh boy, he was trying to get, basically have this highway connect the Manhattan and the uh, Williamsburg Bridge to the, to the Hudson River. And she had to deal with being talked down to. Because she was a woman, she had to deal with being talked down to and being condescended to. Uh, even Moses himself, at one point he was saying, nobody is against this. Nobody. Nobody but a bunch of mothers as if that's such a horrible thing. Come on, he had a mother. Making Mama Moses real proud with that comment. Huh, you jerk. I think Robert Moses might be the only one who didn't have a mother. <laughs> it's possible. He probably, he was actually spawned by from two a- highways. He was spawned by two highways <laughs> making love? No. I don't know. I mean, it was basically a David and Goliath with her and Moses. I mean, Moses got whatever he wanted for decades in this city and just this housewife, this mother, took him on and beat him on some of the biggest projects that would have ruined the city. Soho's still around today, and we can all go there, buy our coffee, and then when we get the bill, question our decisions to live here. Uh, you know, it's pretty expensive down there. Um, but, you know, she basically paved the way for not only, not only the social activism, but theory. The death and life of great American cities is studied in colleges all over the country and architectural and urban planning schools all over the country and the world. Uh, you know, that and, you know, kids who read Nietzsche for the first time and then study abroad in London and come back with a, an English accent. She also said that uh, cities fail for the same reason democracies fail, which is one of the things that's very important. We all got to be involved. We all got to, you know, do our part to inform, to participate, to protest, to have our voice or lack of voice be heard. Uh, she had a really great quote, too, that said, cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. We all got to have a say in it, and it's that chaos of people coming together, the ballet, as she called it, of people coming together under the umbrella of the city uh, and contributing their part, but also having their say, that uh, allows a city to be a hotbed of ideas, of culture, of politics, of business. So uh, all those things are very important. Uh, pretty cool story, huh, Eric? Pretty cool story. I know it was a long one, but uh, it's a good one. It's a good one and very important one. One of these days I'm going to do a whole video about her. One of these days I'm going to write a whole book about her. Uh, anyways, let's keep moving. What do you think? City sidewalks, city sidewalks, dressed in holiday style. Uh, don't mind that. Just here to wrap up the video. I'm in this little park in the West Village and we pretty much made it to the end. Um, we talked about a lot today, baby. We talked about uh, the amazing crooner. Billy Holiday, I don't know if you consider that crooning, but you can consider that crooning, right, Eric? Okay, also we talked about uh, Francis Perkins, the first cabinet uh, secretary in history uh, here in New York. We talked about um, Emma Lazarus, and we talked about all, you know, Jane Jacobs. 
uh, Jane Jacobs, Jane Jacobs. Pretty, pretty good little uh, uh, variety of women. Not enough uh, female, uh, you know, historical figures here in New York are talked about. So I thought I'd, you know, remedy that today. Uh, you know, uh, guys, if you enjoyed the video, please uh, go ahead and look at, check out the Patreon. You know, that's a big help. That's how we fund these things. You know, trying to do it the old-fashioned way, grassroots, baby. I don't need no stinking, you know, Starbucks endorsement. Uh, but uh, also to uh, like and subscribe. That also helps boost us, uh, bump us in the analytics. Uh, you know, support small business, baby. This is small business. Ah, come on, right, Eric? Very small. We're Very a minuscule, we're a almost non-existent business. Micro business. Micro uh, business. Uh, but yeah, um, that's pretty much it. We're out of here freezing our uh, booties off. So we got to get out of here, man. It's freezing. Uh, you learned something, Eric? I learned a lot of things today, Tom. Did you? Yes. Well, that's enough for I, me. I learned that Jane saved the city several times. Jane Jacobs has saved the city, uh, what we are trying to do now. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's pretty much it, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, see you all later. Sick.